everybody. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Hi, everybody. I am Scott Branson, your host. Thanks for being with me today on this Tuesday edition of the podcast. Reminder, always find a way. Subscribe to the audio version wherever you get your audio, whether it's Apple iTunes, whether it is Apple Podcasts, I should say, Google Podcasts, Spotify. I heard a bunch of Spotify folks this week chime in and say they listen to it there. So wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thanks. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button along with the notifications bell. That way you know every time we have a new video. Mo Moten is off this week, and so you got me solo, but lots to talk about with the Raiders. First up, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, the salary cap changed as of June 1st. Now we're on the fourth day of June, so the Raiders have some room there. What are they going to do with that money is part of the questions. Also, OTAs, did we learn anything? We talked about it last time. Shorts, helmets, let's not get carried away. Uh, second segment, we're going to be talking to Matthew Collar of Purple Insider. He covered Alexander Madison over with the Vikings, now part of the Raiders. Will he have a career resurgence? So we're going to get some insight into Madison from Matthew coming up in segment two. And then segment three, of course, is your phone calls. Yes, we got more phone calls this week. So we're going to get you on the air to talk with you and get your voice out there in the Raider Nation mailbag. All right, so let's jump off in uh, Raiders complete second week of OTAs. As Mo and I have been saying for the last several weeks since OTA started, don't get too carried away with what you're hearing out of there because they are in shirts and helmets. There's not much going on. They're getting familiar. They're getting ready to get into camp next month when the real action starts where we'll find out what this team is going to look like, who's going to play where, who's going to win out on that offensive line, who's going to win out at quarterback. We talked about it last week uh, on Thursday that we felt, Mo and I did, that Aiden O'Connell has the edge. I think he does, number one, he's been in the system. Number two, he's played for Antonio Pierce overall. He did well last year. But now you have Gardner Minshew there. It's going to be a good competition. Again, it's not taking sides. I think you have to look at it from the perspective of you want the best guy to win. If that's O'Connell, great. If it's Minshew, great. Whoever plays the best, and again, we won't see a lot of it. It's going to be in practice. So the fact that somebody may win that job and you'll be like, well, why didn't this? I saw this. I saw that. We'll see. You know, We'll have to find out uh, who is able to separate themselves from the other, and that'll be the best thing for the Raiders because you want the hottest hand, the person who's grasped the offense and performed the best leading into the regular season. I don't think either one of them will play a ton – in the preseason, so we'll see how that all ends up. But but we'll watch on that. Of course, the offensive line right now looks like we're going to have the left side of Colton Miller and then Jackson Powers Johnson over there, the rookie from Oregon. By the way, he's nursing some injuries, so we got to watch that closely too. Hopefully, there's nothing that's going to prevent him or Colton Miller from playing. And then on the right side, probably a Dylan Parham switching over to right guard, and then of course at right tackle, Thayer Munford Jr. looks to be the guy unless something happens between now and camp or during camp, uh, once they get out there and the coaches and the GM, Tom Telesco, are able to see what's going on with this team, watching them go at it, we won't really know. They could make another move. They could go try to get a, a veteran. I doubt it, but we'll see what happens. Now, that is sort of that. We also have running back. And, of course, as I said, in the second segment, we're going to talk to Matthew Collar from Purple Insider about Alexander Madison. Who is he going to be for the Raiders? Uh, we saw a good story from Ed Graney and the RJ about him and saying, hey, you know, maybe he's going to have a resurgence with the Raiders. And we also have Zamir White. Zamir White really looks to be the 1A back uh, as, of, as of now with Josh Jacobs gone. So you have him at 1A, probably Madison at 1B. We'll see. We'll see how the competition goes. But we'll at least learn from Matthew a little bit about what Madison brings to the table. Why why did he not perform too well last year in Minnesota? 700 yards rushing after they gave him the extension and they said goodbye to Dalvin Cook. No touchdowns rushing. He had a couple or three, I think, receiving. So we'll see what Matthew has to say about Alexander Madison and, Madison and what he's going to be able to do for this Raiders roster. So we'll check that out. But the good news is, as you know, June 1st, just a few days ago, the team now moves. The Jimmy Garoppolo nightmare is officially over, folks. So the contract, everything is gone. And now they have, they go, they jump from 17 million to 34 million in cap space. So, what do they do with that cap space? Of course, we talked about free agency. 
The Raiders still need help at cornerback. I still believe they're going to bring in a cornerback. Where else do they need help? They could use help at safety, perhaps. Now, they have a couple young draft picks at both cornerback and safety. We know that. Okay. And so where are they at? We'll have to see. And who's going to be on the street? We don't know quite yet. There's going to be some players post-release uh, June 1st. We'll see. And there, there could be some more coming. Uh, but who is out there? I wrote a piece up on Sports Knot last week or two weeks ago about top cornerbacks that the Raiders could consider. Uh, Xavier Howard being one of them. One that I prefer, Adoree Jackson, of course, with the New York Giants, played for Patrick Graham, knows the system well, could slot in on that other side of the outside cornerback position from Jack Jones. So you look at that and you think, wow, okay, Adoree Jackson. You also have Stephon Gilmore. Yes, uh, older player, not what he used to be, but he had a great resurgent year in Dallas last year. So you have him. And then Steven Nelson, a less sexy option, but very, very capable cornerback uh, from Houston. He played with the Houston Texans last year. I played with the Chiefs and the Steelers and the Eagles in addition. So he's a, he's a little bit of a journeyman, but he gets the job done. He had a good year last year there as well. And then you have Patrick Peterson, who would be trying to make a comeback after his, his kind of strange journey. So when you look at the salary cap and what the Raiders' needs currently are, you look at offensive line, you look at uh, cornerback, you look at linebacker still, I think even with the drafting, of Tommy Eichenberg from Ohio State, and of course, Robert Spillane. Then you have Malcolm Hoos. Now, the other side of this, as we talked about it last week, folks, was not just going out and signing free agents, but who else do you use this money on? Who do you want to extend? And we talked a little bit about that. Some of you disagreed with us on it. A lot of you want them to extend Spillane. I don't think they do because, not because he didn't play well for the Raiders, because he played great last year, but he's not a guy Tom Telesco brought in. Tom Telesco has a record of drafting young Linebackers. Now, yes, he did go get Khalil Mack and so on, but I do think that um, Robert Spillane, if he does well this year, then they'll do everything they can to sign him. But I think Malcolm Kuntz is going to be a priority with the extension. You saw them give the the raise to to Max Crosby, obviously well deserved. So that's good. The other thing here, I think, is you look at some of the restructures and what they can do with Devonte Adams. We talked about that at length before but when you look at uh, the opportunity to extend some of those guys i think Kuntz rises to the top because of his position and because of the pricing linebackers don't bring in the the the, the money that they used to so if you're the raiders you have to look at who do you who can you sign at premium positions now that will save you money in the future right so i think that that's malcolm Kuntz. Men, much of you have mentioned nate hobbs uh, and I think that one, yes, is possible. Although, remember, he's missed 11 games over the last two years. Young player, I think he's the future there in the in the slot for them. But I do believe that he's not priority one. I think Koontz would be a primary one. The other guys that you're looking at, uh, the opportunity there, uh, maybe Trayvon Morig, who has been up and down. He's played consistently, though, I would say, in the last year. So there, there's some opportunities for them to lock up that younger talent at a lower price with Kuntz being the the, the major one uh, because of his promise that he showed last season, only 25 years old. And the position just requires more money when you're talking about a guy who's a defensive end, an edge rusher. They they just, just they, they bring more money. Now they have Tyree Wilson, of course, who's going to be there as well. So he's uh, only on the second year of his contract. So they, they they're not they're not. If they can lock in Malcolm Kuntz, if they really believe he's going to continue to develop like he has, then you you lock him up now because it'll cost you a lot less money to do that than to wait till after this year and try to negotiate on the open market. So we'll see what there. Outside of that, other positions that the Raiders need. I mean, they're I think they're good clearly at um, at the at the uh, wide receiver position. I think they're also good, obviously, at tight end. Running back, I think fine there too. I don't think they're going to make any changes. Again, I think on offense, the only thing I could see there is offensive linemen, perhaps them looking to do that. Also on the defense, we talked about linebacker. We talked about cornerback. The defensive front looks to be good too with the young talent they have there. And of course, uh, the big signing of Wilkins in the off season. So to me, they're good there on offense. It's just going to come back to the quarterback play. So how will O'Connell and Minshew do? That's going to be the key. And so you, you're, you're set there. you got your guys. Who the number three quarterback is, we'll see. But I do think that you're you're settled. And so it's going to be up to Luke Getze, as we've been saying over and over and over again on this show, as you guys know. 
It's going to be up to Luke Getze to take what he has on offense, these weapons that they have on offense, and do the best job that they can with that. And he's going to have to put them to use. And you're going to have to get good quarterback play. It doesn't have to be all pro quarterback play because these two quarterbacks, I believe, and I know some of you disagree, you keep throwing up examples like, well, what about Tom Brady? Come on, guys. Tom Brady, six-round draft pick. I get it. And I know Aiden O'Connell for just you can't compare it to Tom Brady. I know what you're saying, though, and it's it's well taken. Your point's well taken, which is you never know. Uh, but I think Tom Brady, when he came into the league, yes, he played a long time. You look at his offensive lines. You have to have a quarterback who can create more in the pocket. We'll see if O'Connell's gotten better at that. I think some of it he can get better and will get better at it. At the same time, I don't think he has the skill set to be as mobile. Now, Minshew, not a mobile quarterback either. He can do a little more in the pocket with his feet to avoid the rush and to also create plays downfield. But to me, he's not the long-term answer either. So I'm not saying the long-term answer is there at quarterback. That's a discussion we'll have ongoing through not only this offseason, but through the season and see what the Raiders do. And it's not just my opinion. It's the opinion, I think, of most people who cover the league. A lot of folks... If you don't watch a lot of the rest of the league other than your team, you might not see it. But if you look at the quarterbacks and the quarterbacks that are being successful, um, you have to have that. So can O'Connell make that leap? I don't think it's possible enough for him to become a franchise quarterback. Now, I could be wrong. I'd be more than happy to be wrong. But I think we'll get a definitive answer on that this season, whether he wins the job or not. If he wins the job, clearly, he's going to be the better quarterback in the building, and we'll see how he develops with the tools he has, with the new coaching staff he has, if that offensive line holds up, they get the right side set, and if Theo Mumford Jr. comes along like they feel he will, then, then maybe, just maybe, he'll do it. We'll see. But I don't think you can compare Joe Montana and all these quarterbacks from, from eras past. First of all, they're, they're all Hall of Famers. Number two, it, so it's easy in hindsight to say, what about Hull? What about, you know, Joe Montana was a first-round draft pick, of course, but – but the game has changed. You know, look, I'm an older guy, but some of you older guys come on there. Oh, what about this guy? Dude, it was 40 years ago. The game has changed now, okay? Just like it's changed from a size perspective and a speed perspective. So you have to consider that. Now, again, anything can happen. Maybe Aiden O'Connell proves me 100% wrong. And I'll be, again, I don't. it's not that I dislike the kid. People on here making comments, disrespect. No, you earn respect, my friend. When Aiden O'Connell becomes a, a good winning starting quarterback, then he's going to earn respect from everybody. I respect Aiden O'Connell. If if you feel like we hate on Aiden O'Connell on the show, then you clearly haven't listened to the show that much uh, going back to last season. So there's no disrespect. There's just my point of view. You can agree with it or not. See, that's the thing. When you have a podcast, a radio show like we do, and on video here like we do as well, you put your opinions out there. You might like them. You might not like them. I'm putting my opinion out there. Doesn't mean I'm going to be right, but you can come and tell me I'm wrong. But until there's proof, I'm going to be right. So we'll see how it goes. But again, if, if, if Aiden O'Connell does more than I think he's capable of, that's great for the Raiders. So you got to love it. So we'll move on uh, with that and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens at the quarterback position. Doesn't have to be a fight. No factions, Minshew versus O'Connell. It's the best guy wins. And if the best guy wins, that's the best for the Raider team and for all of you out there as fans. So we'll see how it rolls around. All right, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, Matthew Collar from Purple Insider is going to be our guest. We're going to talk all about Alexander Madison and uh, whether or not Matthew believes he can make a comeback and be a more, I think, uh, forceful and impactful running back like he was in Minnesota as part of a rotation there with Dalvin Cook. But uh, we'll get the inside from him and, and hear his perspective on it. Then in the last segment, of course, we'll get to your phone calls. All right. This is Scott Branson. and this is Silver and Black Today. Appreciate you guys being here. We'll be back right after these words. Welcome back, Silver and Black Today. Scott Branson with you and joining us now from Purple Insider. Uh, both the website, you can catch uh, Minnesota Vikings coverage there, also the podcast, great YouTube channel as well, is Matthew Collar. He, you can follow him on X. Dot com at Matthew Collar. That's E-R, by the way, at the end. Uh, we appreciate he joins us uh, from Minneapolis. And Matthew, wanted to talk to you about uh, not Justin Jefferson. We know you just covered that story. Big one. Uh, and anybody who thought that they were going to trade Justin Jefferson, I think, was crazy. 
Uh, but it's got to be great for Vikings fans to know that they got him in the fold. They gave him his deal. And now you can go and focus on uh, getting some wins under the belt for the Vikings in the, in the NFC central there. Oh yeah. No question. Um, because with the Jefferson rumors, I was uh, at the edge of my sanity. Um, <laughs> first of all, knowing that the, we're not very close to the start of the season. So everyone panicking and, uh, buying into the rumors and all those things was like, wait, can we just understand that it's still the beginning of June and we could take a deep <laughs> breath here and let this thing play out. The Vikings had never said anything that would indicate they were not planning on signing Justin Jefferson and making him the highest paid wide receiver in the NFL, which seems like a good idea to me because he's the best wide receiver in the NFL. But we got a lot of people who, I don't know, watch the movie Moneyball too many times <laughs> who were looking for some way to trade Justin Jefferson rather than paying him. But franchises, when you get a hold of a player of this caliber, you do oh, yeah. not let that player go most of the time. I, I would compare it to Nick Bosa or Aaron Donald. This is somebody that you want to retire with your jersey on and go into your wall of fame and all those types of different things. And uh, so now at least they'll take another step closer. And with the salary cap and everything else, the way that they've managed it, allowing Kirk Cousins to leave and go to Atlanta, drafting a quarterback. Now you give the quarterback, Justin Jefferson, and they still have cap space to continue to fill out yes. this roster. So it's a, a little bit of a all's well that ends well type of situation. But now, as you said, the pressure is on for Jefferson to justify the contract and to be a, a major role player in taking J.J. McCarthy where they need him to go in order to compete in the NFC. Well, it helps having him out there for J.J. McCarthy to throw to. That's right. And I think I think some of those rumors, Matthew, were probably concocted somewhere in Cincinnati, right? Because everybody there wanted to see the Joe Burrow, Jamar. Yeah, it just wasn't going to happen. So uh, they the, the fantasies are done with, but that's just the, how, how, it, how it rolls out. But let's get into what we want to talk to you about today, and that is now a Las Vegas Raider. That, of course, is Alexander Madison, who just came, was released by the Vikings after this past season. Of course, he signed a two-year, $7 million extension last year after they said goodbye to Dalvin Cook. And the thinking there was, right, that Alexander Madison could step in and be the number one running back. It didn't quite work out that way. Talk a little bit about why Madison didn't see. I mean, he gained 700 yards, did not, we all know the story, did not reach the end zone as a running back. I think he caught three touchdown passes, but he did not rush for any. What was what's the history of Madison in Minnesota and why it didn't end up working out in the end? Yeah, so it's interesting because when the Vikings drafted Alexander Madison, they did it in 2000 and I believe, what was it, 18, 19, wh whichever year it was uh, when they were, oh yeah, into 19 because they were going to Gary Kubiak and uh, Kevin Stefanski and their system to run a, a zone offense. And he had done that a lot at Boise State. So they identified him as somebody that they wanted to run that outside zone and kind of be a battering ram type of running back. So you had Delvin Cook, who is your speed and juke guy. And then you have, you know, your kind of thunder and lightning type of thing. And that worked out extremely well for them under Gary Kubiak and Kevin Stefanski and then Clint Kubiak in 2021. And he looked like someone who could be a starting running back in the NFL. But when they changed systems under Kevin O'Connell and they were running what they called kind of a mid zone, but it was not the traditional outside stretch wide zone that you're so familiar with someone like Gary Kubiak running. And it never felt comfortable for Alexander Madison uh, making the reads kind of inside the tackles just didn't really work for him. He seemed a little bit over anxious at times and ran into the back of offensive linemen. Uh, there were a number of other things that happened as well, including that they couldn't quite figure out the interior of their offensive line. They had Ezra Cleveland was their starting left guard there. And then they went to Dalton Reisner, who is a very good pass protector, but one of the worst PFF graded run blockers in the NFL. You have Ed Ingram on the other side in his second year, taking a step forward, but is not a prolific run blocker either. And then a center who was more built in his run blocking game for that stretch wide zone, who has been, you know, I think average, but was a difference maker with the wide zone. So the combination of the running back who was perfectly built for a system, an interior offensive line that was pretty questionable and run blocking. And then I would still say that Kevin O'Connell has not found his rhythm when it comes to 
how to just play call for the running game, how to design the running game. That was so much. Gary Kubiak is legendary for that with all the great running backs that have followed him. And uh, Kevin O'Connell is extremely pass first in his offensive approach. One of the most heavy pass leaning offenses in the NFL. Even after Kirk Cousins got hurt, we still saw Josh Dobbs and Nick Mullins throwing the ball 35 and 40 times. So that was never really going to work uh, with Madison. Although I would say that I was surprised uh, by his performance. I thought it would be better. Uh, and I think there was some element of him knowing I'm the guy now I'm taking mm -hmm. over for Delvin cook. And I have to justify that all the time. And there was an incident in Philadelphia in week two that kind of set the tone for this, where he had a tough game and the fantasy football freaks started attacking him and his family on the internet. It was a national game, people calling him the N word and stuff like that. Yeah. So we had a conversation with him about that kind of trying to urge fans to calm down when it comes to the fantasy football stuff. And I think he discovered that being Delvin cook is not that easy that when you have everything on your shoulders, it is harder. There's so much more pressure. I think it got to him at times mentally, all that pressure. And because we saw him do things that he just didn't do before. I mean, one of them being running into his own lineman and not, you know, being a little more patient and then dropping passes. He is a good pass catcher. I know this. I have seen him do it. And I was shocked last year at the number of passes that he dropped on just screens or underneath stuff. And that might have been a little bit of the mental. I'm hmm. trying too hard to be the guy because that's what everybody told me throughout the entire training camp. So I think a, a fresh start for him with the Raiders um, could kind of bring him back to what he was before. Cause he's certainly not old and he doesn't have a whole lot of mileage. So I still see some um, good potential there for Alexander Madison. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think <clears throat> with any NFL player, and we talk about this on the show all the time, Matthew, with my partner, Mo Moten, who's on vacation this week, but we talk about players that get into a system and it's not necessarily the best fit and how that's not always indicative of the player not being up to snuff, that sometimes situations can dictate that, right? So you look at a player in a system and you talked about it with Madison early on under Kubiak, outside zone block, zone running. Now, the Raiders, that's why he makes so much sense for the Raiders. Luke Getze, who you saw and watched in Chicago, under mixed reviews, clearly there, down there. But he's now in Las Vegas. He ran the uh, seventh most, I think, two running back sets in the league last year. So Alexander Madison, I think, is coming in. He's not expected to be the bell cow back like, like Minnesota expected him to be. He's going to probably be behind three-year player Zamir White, who's a younger player if it works out that way. And as a tandem, you saw him work that way in Minnesota. You talked about the pass catching. What else did you see from him in those outside zone sets uh, that makes him, I mean, he played it in college too at Boise State. What makes him valuable in that situation? What did you see from him when he was playing well in Minnesota? Well, and I do think that even uh, running behind a fullback, if that's a possibility there, could be good for him. Uh, Kevin O'Connell used the fullback in a very different way, kind of used CJ Ham as a blocker in passing situations rather than putting him in I formations and running play actions off that. So maybe there's some opportunities there to do something similar uh, to get him uh, behind a fullback a little bit more. But, you know, when, when he was playing under uh, Gary Kubiak and Kevin Stefanski, I thought that he was... A, I mean, battering ram is a good way to, to describe <laughs> it, but somebody that you just didn't want to tackle because he does not have breakaway speed. He's not somebody that's going to run away from you and create a, a huge amount of explosive plays. What he was good for is just successful plays. I see uh, pro football reference has brought on the successful uh, success rate, and uh, it's got a whole formula that you have to explain to everyone. But as far as just using the eye test of what's a successful run. Is he plowing forward for four yards, for five yards, setting you up for a good situation on second down when he gets a first down run? If he runs into traffic, can he carry a guy to get a three-yard gain where there was supposed to be nothing really there? That's what he was doing in his first couple of years. And I just thought with the outside zone stuff, he was good at making that decision where you go wide or you have to cut back. And when he would cut back, he would do it with a lot of power and we just saw him run over a lot of people. I, and, and that was what he was kind of known for is being a high intelligence back who could pass block as well. And just as a general, as a person, you're not going to run into too many people 
who you're going to respect more in the locker room, who are going to be able to learn your offense very, very quickly, understand what their assignments are and pass protect. Uh, Madison is, is good across the board at those things. And I still have to believe that last year was a small sample size of him dropping passes because there were times where they could run him on routes. I remember specifically he scored a touchdown where he, I think, motioned out to a wide receiver, ran a slant route, caught a you know, a pass that was right there and went in for a touchdown. Those are things that he can do, but just did not happen very consistently last year. And I will say too, that it wasn't a total disaster. There were games where he was pretty good last year. The unfortunate part was uh, that he fumbled in one of those games in a yeah. key spot, which just added to the stress that he had been under and is not a guy who fumbles a lot. And it just was a bad luck kind of thing. So it didn't work out very well last year, but I wouldn't say that that means that his career is over or anything else like that. Yeah, and he had a he was off to a great start against the Raiders actually and then he got hurt if you recall. And so I know Raider fans have seen him and and they're actually excited to be there and you talked about pass protection because if you look at this Raiders team um you know Aiden O'Connell young quarterback did okay last year from Purdue uh but not mobile. Then you have Gardner Minshew who you're familiar with who has a little more mobility, but he's not a mobile quarterback either. So the Raiders really need to get good protection up front from their offensive line like everybody does. But I think having Madison there, having a guy like Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer, obviously two big tight ends, will help as well. You talked about that pass pr protection. Um, how, how, how good is he in pass protection? You talked about he's good across the board, but when it comes to that situation and his ability to protect the quarterback, what did you see? Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like he's going to completely change your life with the pass protecting. Uh, I think when it comes to pass protecting, it's how I approach high school was if you get a C, then it's fine. Uh, and, and But the biggest thing with pass protection is usually just knowing where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to block. Uh, that's always been my understanding is that someone like uh, you're familiar with Amir Abdullah. He played yes. here that Amir Abdullah can be a pretty decent pass protector if he just because he's smart enough, and he knows where to go and what he's supposed to be doing. And I think that that's Alexander Madison. He's got strength. He's got the girth. Uh, but really, I think the reason that coaching staffs have always liked him is that he's a high intelligence player and you can ask him to do a lot of different things. He's never going to have the lightning back there. He's not going to be Charlie Garner for the, uh, the old school Raiders fans. <laughs> not going to be Good that one. guy, but he could be Tyrone Wheatley though. I, that's more of uh, the type of running back that he is. And I think when you, when you're asking him to be out there for three downs, if you need that, you can have him pass protect. You can leak him out of the backfield and make a play to get a first down. And so he can be an effective three down back. I would want him paired with someone else. So it's not something you're doing all the time, but on third down, uh, the Vikings were able to use him pretty effectively. Yeah, and it's it. I think to your point about last year and and the mental side of things, right? Because I think uh, people who cover the game, fans who watch the game, they don't always understand that. And and sometimes things can snowball, and suddenly you're in a situation not too good. And I think coming to the Raiders, Antonio Pierce, of course, him and Antonio Pierce's son played together in college, right? So there's a relationship there as well, which is big, as you know, in the NFL. And then the type of football that Antonio Pierce wants to play which is a little more physical with the run game. And obviously that's why Luke gets, he's there. So we'll see how it all goes down, but very interesting stuff. And we appreciate you spending so much time with us talking about that. And uh, I know the Vikings are going to have an exciting year there with the new quarterback. And of course, Justin Jefferson now in the fold, no worries uh, for the Vikes as they can start. They can still yell skull Vikes and not have to worry about anything about Justin Jefferson, Matthew caller from the purple insider, man. Thanks for joining us again here on silver and black today. Absolutely. I'm just glad you didn't ask me to talk at all about last year's game because that I still <laughs> oh, have terrible. nightmares from that oh, yeah. game. I mean, when I travel to Las Vegas, <laughs> I expect to have a good time yeah. and I had a good time outside of the game, <laughs> but I did not have a good time. Oh. That was one of the worst football games I've ever seen in my life. It was. And that's the one we talk about too, because a lot of Raider fans um, disagree with me when I tell them that Aiden O'Connell, it's only been a half a year he's played, but I, I've covered the league enough to know that I just don't think he's a franchise quarterback. He's going to be yeah. a good quarterback. He's a good kid, has a good ball, the whole thing. And they disagree with me. And then I bring up Minnesota and they get quiet um, as well as not having a pass pass. Yeah, and people say I'm picking on him. I'm not picking on him. I like the kid. But to your point, so it was a tough game to watch. Hopefully we don't see it. It reminded me of like when my dad in the late 50s used to watch the Vikings and the Bears, right? 
with uh, five yards muck. and a cloud yep. of dust. Yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> uh, everybody loves the unproven quarterback. So uh, exactly. maybe he'll win the job and sh- kind of show what he's got there. But yeah, yes. no, I appreciate you having me on. And uh, honestly, the, the best of luck to Alexander Madison, because, you know, when you cover somebody for their whole career, you get to know them through the years. And he was one of the classiest players you're ever going to come across. So that's one thing. I can't guarantee fantasy football performance, <laughs> but I can guarantee that Alexander Madison is going to be somebody that the organization really likes. Yeah, no, it's it's that that's always good to hear too because I think Raider Raider Nation in particular, people get very close with the players, and um, you know, you know, not every player is as cordial to fans and the media, especially, and when you hear somebody like Alexander Madison having such a great off the field uh, reputation, it's it's very cool too. So Matthew, thanks, man. Good luck this coming season, and we'll talk to you down the line. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, it's time for the Raider Nation mailbag here on Silver and Black today in Aussie Original Podcast. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody, to Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports Original Podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Scott Branson with you again. Mo Moten on vacation this week. He'll be back next week. So you got me solo. But I'm not solo because this, the home stretch here, we have the Raider Nation mailbag. So I got phone calls from you guys, which always helps out because I love uh, I love hearing from you. We get we got great calls the last several weeks, and we're going to continue to have calls on every show through the offseason. Sorry, I'm adjusting my microphone here. Um, so we'll have that for the rest of the offseason, and then during the season, we obviously have our, our mailbag version show as well. So uh, lots to get to as well. Do us a favor. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, do so wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thanks again for being so involved in the chat there. Do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. Also hit the notifications bell and a thumbs up is always appreciated too. So we'll get into that. All right. We're going to get into the mailbag here too. Different, different calls from all over the place. And first we're going to go to Jordan in Canada and second, our second call from Canada in two weeks. So here's Jordan with the first call here on the Raider Nation mailbag. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. It's Jordan Dog calling from Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's about an hour <laughs> from Watertown, New York, and about three hours from Toronto. I'm a first-time caller and being a Raiders fan for about 30 years since I was about 10 years old. The two reasons why I'm calling is, one, to encourage you both on your show, and two, I have a question for Mo. When I started looking for a Raiders podcast, I listened to a few shows and quickly yours became my favorite. I've been a Raiders, uh, I've been a fan of Mo's articles, which are honest and realistic takes, and you being on the pod sold me. Mo, you are different, and that's why you get attention, whether it's good or bad. Don't change. You tell people what they need to hear and not what they want to hear. Scott, you are new to me, but I really enjoy listening to you. As a host, as you seem like a genuine guy who also gives his honest takes, no apologies needed. So my question for Mo is, when did you decide to take this career path? How did you do it? And finally, what was your biggest hurdle or what challenges did you face? Thanks, guys, for your time and keep up the great work. And as Chris Berman would say, There's Jordan, north of the border, just over the border from from New York there, three hours from Toronto. He's all about it. Sorry, had to make fun of you, Jordan, there. No, I appreciate it, man. Good friend of mine from Toronto area as well. Uh, And Canadian Raider fans are always awesome. I mean, there's so many up there. It's great to see and great to hear. And, of course, your question for Mo, and he's not here. So what I'm going to do is I wanted to make sure we got your call on so you knew we were listening to you. But we will ask Mo that. Uh, on on next Tuesday's show when he's back, we'll ask him that. But I do know that Mo Mo's story is is a great one, uh, and he's he went went to college, went to St. John's, studied journalism, ended up working for the library system in New York, wasn't working in sports, and then did it. So I'll let him tell you his journey, and and do that. But I think we live at a very interesting time, and and my journey too. Just to share with you, I know you didn't ask me about it, and I appreciate the compliments from Mo and the fact that uh, he brought you into the show and and your your kind words for me as well as host is uh you know for me I started that way too as journalism I started working in in college sports 
and then got into the private sector, got into uh, PR, communications, media relations, worked for some big companies like Intuit, uh, H&R Block, Applebee's, uh, Premier Boxing Champion. So I, I, got, I got around. So I kind of got away from journalism. And then when I was in Las Vegas in 2017, I founded the websites, uh, which was originally called Las Vegas Raiders Report. We then switched it to Silver and Black Today, which you hear on the show. That's where the show started and the podcast started uh, as well. And so I kind of got back into it. And what's remarkable, and I'll just share this. And again, we'll get Mo to share Jordan next week, his story for you. So make sure you tune in there as well. But um, what's amazing about Times right now is you, you, you see a lot of fan-generated content, which some people like. Some people want this show to be fan, where we only, uh, uh, I think, celebrate the Raiders and only talk about positive things. That's not what we do. We're objective, as you know, listening to Mo and I. But it's amazing what you can do now. So if you're somebody who wants to do it, it it's in some ways it's easier than ever because you can find opportunities to write. I used to have writers on my website when Silver and Black Today before it became part of Sports Knot, where I were now, where I work as well as a journalist. Um, you 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 can have the opportunity to write for these sites and and learn, right? I always took on new writers. They weren't professional writers. They didn't necessarily come from a journalism background, and so I think. My advice out there is just do it. I get people who contact me all the time about podcasts, about writing and that kind of stuff is just do it. It takes time and you have to uh, find opportunities to do it and, and not expect it to happen very quickly. There's a lot of people who want the notoriety. They want to be a quote unquote personality very fast. Uh, and, and, but they don't do, they don't put in the hard work. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, Mo is particularly a very detailed writer who puts in a lot of research time. There's a lot of stuff on the web that is very what we call quick hitters boom story comes in you do a quick story on it you spend you know 10 minutes 15 minutes and then you write it out three four hundred words nothing wrong with that that's part of where we are today because we want information so quickly but the kind of work he does the kind of work i do mostly is longer lead stuff so you're going to take time to research it come up with a premise then you have to go find the data to prove it uh, and and research it, so so that is the difference there. But I think those journey, everybody's journey is different. You you have a lot of traditional journalists who went the traditional route. I say traditional tongue in cheek now because I don't think there is one anymore. But older people, older men, women who are in the business, they went through more traditional route. That's why you'll see a lot of folks who have podcasts or write online. Some of these newspaper reporters, magazine guys who went through the long road of getting where they're at, they they sometimes resent or look down upon people who started in digital media. They didn't earn their stripes and blah, blah, blah. Now, there are some people who don't deserve it because their work doesn't hold up or they're into the click clickbaity stuff. And that's fine. But um, I would just say that you, if you want to do something, you can do it. Look, it doesn't matter whether you studied journalism or not. You can study it on your own. There's more information available to you on how to do it, how to be ethical about it, how to find the process, ask people who do it. So, so there's really no excuse. And, and, and I see a lot of people that are rising and coming out of different backgrounds as writers, podcasters, broadcasters, you name it. So uh, good stuff. But we will get that, that question to Mo for you, Jordan, next week. But a great call. I appreciate it as always. All right. Now we go out to guy we haven't heard from in a little bit, at least last week. And that is our good friend Jacob in Fresno, who always cracks me up with his little intro. Uh, but that's what we're going to get into now. Here's Jacob from Fresno on the Raider Nation mailbag. Amir Abdullah, and a guy who a lot of people think is, you know, uh, 
a diet Christian McCaffrey. He's the great value Christian McCaffrey. We'll see what happens. And we've got a Gary Sanders 2.0 coming. We'll see. Uh, but if you look at the, the whole setup of our offensive roster, technically speaking, we are as good or worse at both of those positions this year. And so my question is if we're an offense last year that struggled to put up 20 points, what is it with the guys that we have on this roster? What is it that we have to do in order to guarantee or to make sure that we're going to be better? At mm. least we'll say that. We'll give it, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. What do we have to do to be just better? Because does it have to be that the offensive line with JPJ improves tremendously? Does it have to be that Luke Jesse is just that much better of a play caller than I can't even remember the guy's name that we had. <laughs> it looked like Cindy Luke out there calling plays. No disrespect to him, you know, PC upon and all that. But uh, what is it that our offense has to do? What do we got to do, guys? What do we got to do to get 24 points a game? You guys let me know. You take it easy. Go Raiders. There we go. Jacob in Fresno wasn't happy that that the call didn't make it through last week. Sorry, Jacob. We got we got stuck with some time. And I can't remember with your call why it wasn't on. So apologies. But thanks for calling back in. So a couple of things. Number one, you forgot the guy we talked about last segment with Matthew Collar from from Purple Insider, Alexander Madison. He's also in the running back uh, uh, situation there in the running back room and, and the opportunity to earn carries. I think there, listen, I th Josh Jacobs was not that good last year and he got injured. So so I think you're better at the position. Zamir White will get it. We'll see what he does. And then Madison, of course, you mentioned Dylan Lobby as well. Ab Amir Abdullah, who I think is more of a special teams player. But if you look at this situation on offense, you asked, where did they get better? Uh, the question marks, I still think, are those three areas you touched on, which are how will the offensive line be? I think obviously the offensive line on the left side is going to be better with JPJ there. On the right side, moving Parham over and moving, or excuse me, committing to Thayer Munford Jr. at right tackle, they clearly have to be fine. The, the, the line play last year was not terrible. It was not great, but it was good. So uh, do they go backwards or they can't go backwards? Or they need to be good on the right side. So I think that's question one that needs to be answered. Question two, we talked about running back. You have to be able to run the ball effectively. The way Antonio Pierce has said he wants this offense to run, going back to last year, is, you know, you talk about physicality, you talk about toughness, you talk about ill intent, all that jazz, the PR book that he's got going. You, you're you going to have to run the ball. And so you have to be able to run the ball, even though you have all those offensive weapons on the outside with Devontae Adams, with Brock Bowers, with Michael Mayer, with Jacoby Myers, with Trey Tucker, hopefully. You have those guys. And um, so you feel like that'll be better, but it comes down to quarterback play, my friend. So quarterback play last year, when 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 Aiden O'Connell was doing well, he did well, but he was inconsistent. You would expect that, though, from a rookie. It's not an over-criticism. It is what it is. I mean, you're a rookie. You're learning in a system with a guy, Bo Hardegree, by the way, was his name, Jacob. Bo Hardegree didn't, had not called plays before. So, so you give him a little bit of a pass there, but at the same time, he has to be more consistent. You can't have games like you saw against the Vikings last year where he couldn't, where the Raiders didn't score. You can't have a game like you had uh, against the, the Chiefs where you didn't complete a pass after the first quarter. You can't do that and get better, right? But I would expect Aiden O'Connell to do better than that because he learned last year he did well in spots, and so you just got to be consistent. And Gardner Minshew the same way. So the quarterback play mixed with that offensive line and the running back, are they able to establish the run enough to open up the offense? But it goes back to something Mo and I have been talking a lot on, and we're beating the horse on this one. Luke Getze. Can Luke Getze up the play calling? Can he find the right balance using what he has? And can his quarterbacks give him those options, right? Luke Getze has a mixed history. He doesn't have that much of a history. If you look at what he did in Chicago – you can blame it on Justin Fields if you want, but part of the offensive coordinator's role is to develop quarterbacks. Now, let's just say for the sake of argument, I don't agree with it, but let's say for the sake of argument that Fields just wasn't the guy. Okay, fine. So he was at, but you saw it with Ty, uh, Tyson Bajan who came in and eventually fell off the off the cliff with with that offense too. 
So we'll see what he does. But I think that's what it's going to come down to is how can this offense adjust and what is Luke Getze going to do to take advantage of the Brock Bowers, the Michael Mayers, the Devontae Adams, uh, and, and that. And, and can he get the running game that he needs out of it? And he's going to have to get his offensive line, obviously, to play well to do that and to protect their quarterbacks, whoever it may be. So to me, that's where we're at. And we'll get more into that, too. We're going to have some more guests, as we did today, talking about running backs. We'll have some more looking down the line at this Raiders offense and on Luke Getze as well. So, Jacob, thank you so much for your call. We appreciate it. By the way, if you want to get in on this and you want to call in, I'm going to flash it up on the screen. If you're watching us, if you're listening to us, leave us a message for our next show, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869 is the number. Leave your name, your city you're calling from, and your question or comment, okay? Don't forget your name, where you're calling from, and then, of course, your question or comment will get you on the air uh, for Thursday. So call in. You're listening to this on Tuesday. Hurry up. Give us a call. If you're shy or you've got laryngitis, whatever it is, you can also text us at that same number, 702-900-7869. Same thing, though. Give me your name, where you're calling from. I got some texts, and they don't have names on them. They don't tell me who you are. Where, where you're texting from. So just do that. 702-900-7869 again is the number to call in or to text. So make sure you do that. All right. We're going to get on to our next call. Uh, this is Kenny in Long Beach, California. So we're going out back out to Cali. Here's Kenny. Hey, guys. This is Kenny Malta from Long Beach, California. First time caller. Listen to you guys as much as I can. Love the show. Uh, before I get to my question, I wanted to bring up something that that was pretty funny on the last show that I just, I just listened to May 30th. Uh, there was a guy that I believe text in and Scott was reading it saying something about if the Raiders, there's rumors about the Raiders possibly trading for Hendon Hooker. And what I found funny about that was while you're reading the text, I heard Mo in the background give a big sigh <laughs> and I thought that was funny because uh, I think a few shows ago somebody mentioned how Mo makes that sigh when he doesn't agree with a caller or like he doesn't agree or just doesn't like what he's hearing anyways <laughs> when I heard that that just made me laugh on the way to work but um yeah so my question is for the Raiders offense do you think Luke Getty can pull off something like what Joe Musgrave did back in the day. <laughs> you know, back in the day, that makes me so old. It was only like nine years ago or whatever. Anyway, but yeah, I remember when Jack, Jack Del Rio uh, hired Joe Musgrave, I was like, who is this guy? I, I, I knew there was other candidates that were out there that I wanted over him. can't recall right now. Um, but yeah, I didn't know who Bill Musgrave was and what we we're going to expect from the offense. I believe his first year he was decent, but then the next year, 2016, was when the Raiders really took off, and then that's when Carr had his MVP like year. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you think there are similarities that maybe Getsy can pull off something like that, where people weren't excited to hear him be hired, but then next thing you know, this year or next, he can possibly help us with a top 10 offense with all the weapons that we have. I know it all brings down to what Aiden and Garner can give us, but yeah, let me know what you guys think. And first time caller, love the show. And um, yeah, go Raiders. All right, there you go. Kenny from Long Beach calling. Thanks, man. I appreciate the call and, and the kind words. Listen, I think that's the question is what can Luke Getze do? I'm not going to tell you that he can't because I, I think it's a very open question. I'm open-minded about it. I'm not going to, I saw what happened in Chicago, but I'm not going to say that's going to tell me what happens when in Las Vegas, meaning that different situation, different coaching situation, different quarterback situation, all that kind of stuff. So now being with the Raiders and the philosophy they have, what is he going to do? Can they, can he turn this offense into everything it can be? I think that we'll know that, you know, it'll take some time. But I think we'll know that by midseason. Like, where are they doing? How are they how are they able to utilize those weapons? Yeah, are they getting the quarterback play? And that's not an excuse for Getze, by the way, because I think a lot of it's going to be on Getze to give the quarterbacks he does have the, the plays and the game plans to be able to be successful as they can be, right? 
because I think last year, even though he was a rookie play caller and he didn't do that well very often, Bo Hardegree did change the offense to make sure that it was fitting more for Aiden O'Connell at most, most times. Sometimes he didn't make those changes and that's when Aiden O'Connell didn't do well. But nonetheless, I think that that's what you have to be able to do. So we'll see with Luke Getzey. Can he do that? You use Musgrave as an example, of course, with Derek Carr in those days and how they turned it around. Um, maybe, you know, I think that uh, clearly the coaching staff, Antonio Pierce and, and everybody else believes enough in Luke Getzey that they brought him in. There were other people that they talked to. So they felt he was the best candidate for the job. So we'll see. And then you also have to look down the line of, okay, so you have the two quarterbacks this year. We'll see how they do. And then does Luke Getzey get an opportunity to get a, another quarterback, a more dynamic quarterback, if that's what they have to do, depending what happens, then the question becomes, can he develop a young quarterback? He didn't do it in Chicago, but we don't know all of the details there. So I, you know, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and think that this Raiders offense is going to be a much better than it was last year. It, it, it has to be right. Even though the defense was, was getting stronger and better as the year went on, you still got to score points. Okay. You can't have games where you don't score. And so you're talking 24 point, whatever the right number is, they need to move up the rankings. And if they're not a top 10 offense this year, that's fine. But last year they're what? 23rd. No, you need to be at least in the high teens. If you're running for a playoff spot, I would imagine unless the defense is so dominating, but I just think in the AFC, especially you're going to have to put up points. So uh, good question, Kenny, and we'll keep an eye on that one. And, and that's the big question for us going into camp and, and how they're going to adapt with this offense and again, can Luke get to use the weapons appropriately like you asked? So we'll do that. All right. We're going to get on to our final call of this mailbag. It is from our good buddy, Raider Loke, longtime listener. He calls in all the time. Also interacts with us on X.com all the time. So here's Raider Loke. What is up, Scott and Mo? This is Raider Loke for the 666 Soak Out. <laughs> Just got done listening to your Tuesday episode on my 90 minute can be home, living in traffic, got a little Cali. Regardless, uh, the last time I called was before the draft, and I, even though none of my three options uh, came to fruition, I did mention that I wouldn't be shocked if the Raiders do a shocker on us, and that's exactly what happened, but in a very good way, as we didn't just get a tight end in Brock Bowers, but we got an offensive weapon that we could use all over the field. So, don't mind to get my comments on the draft because I haven't called it to then, but uh, I do want to call and respond to. Uh, I believe uh, it was Raider Easy's call in regards to Luke Getty's offense and, and uh, what are we going to see when it comes to, to uh, Luke Getty's offense when it starts the season. So I do recall Mo mentioning that there may be some influence, but uh, Scott Turner, the passing co game coordinator. But I would not, uh, I, I would not be shocked if, uh, I were, or should I say, uh, let's not forget uh, Edgar Bennett, uh, who is the wide receivers coach, is still on the staff uh, since 2018, ever since we hired Gruden. And, I'm a bit shocked because he was the offensive coordinator at the Green Bay Packers from 2015 to 2017. And I, and I believe there's some history with him and Gruden, but he ended up, you know, demoting and get, getting a wide receivers coach position with the Raiders. So with that being said, uh, Luke Getze was a part of, uh, of his uh, offensive staff with Green Bay. Uh, he was the uh, offensive PC coach when, it, when he was the wide receiver coach. And then when Luke uh, Edgar Bennett got promoted uh, to offensive coordinator, he then got promoted to wide receivers coach as well. And then once Ed, uh, Edgar Bennett left to the Raiders, that's when Luke actually went to Mississippi State and became the offensive coordinator and wide receiver coach. That's when, in 2018, that's when the Packers had that uh, Mike McCarthy firing season. Um, they, uh, Joe Philbin was their interim head coach. So 2018, uh, to me, was like a non-existent season for the Packers. But then in 2019, that's when the Packers hired Luke Getty to be become their quarterback coach and their passing game coordinator. From 2020 to 2023, or 2021, should I say, or sorry, 2019 to 2021, QB coach, passing game coordinator, and offensive coordinator was the Daniel Hackett, and we all know how that happened in different Broncos. So I feel like this is going to be a combination of different minds into this offense. I feel like it'll be not just Bugatti, but also Edgar Bennett, who I feel like he's still with the Raiders because of Devontae Adams. He's been with the coach. So I feel like this offense will be heavily influenced by Devontae Adams because you got Bugatti from the Packers. We've got, and we got a from the Packers, and then I believe Scott Turner will also provide some influence. So just want to provide my thoughts on that, uh, on my thoughts on the Getty and his offense, and what I believe we'll see when it comes to the West Coast offense. So just my thoughts on that, uh, uh, Scott and Mo, this is a uh, right low and I'm out. 
All right, there you go. Raider Loke mentioned Raider Izzy's call last week for, about Luke Getze. A couple of things there from what you were talking about is, yeah, I think – the, the collaboration on offense and where it comes from. And also Antonio Pierce has to be involved. He's the head coach, right? And he does, he he's laid out how he wants his offense to be. Now he's not going to play play call, but he's going to dictate to me. He's going to dictate to get say, Hey, here's how I want to play. This is the style of football. I want to play. So you need to adapt to that and figure out how, how you're going to run the offense. The thing about his time in green Bay, quarterback coach, wide receiver coach, passing game, passing game corner means nothing in the NFL. Just let me say that. It is a title they give guys so it, that are willing or wanting to be an offensive coordinator. He didn't play call in in Green Bay. I'm not saying he didn't have impact. And Devontae Adams talks Devontae Adams talks highly of him, of course, because they worked together in Green Bay. But don't read too much into how they did there. Now, of course, any team does well on offense. It's of course it's everybody working together, but. Nathaniel Hackett, you got the shot in there because he was terrible with the Broncos, but Nathaniel Hackett was a good offensive coordinator. It's why he got the Broncos job. Horrible head coach. Could, clearly couldn't get anything done in Denver, but as an offensive coordinator, very good. Now he's with the Jets. Of course, the Jets fell off Aaron Rodgers after four plays last year, so we don't know how he's done in New York quite yet, although that team played pretty well for what they were doing most of the time. Uh, dealing with the quarterback situation. So I, I think if you look at this and you're trying to look for clues, his Mississippi State time obviously didn't last long there either. So I think that's why we have these open questions, not a negative open question, just a, hey, what's it? What's he going to do? How's he going to be in Las Vegas versus how he was in Chicago? All we have is Chicago to go on as a guy who play call. And, and there's mixed bag there partly because of the quarterback situation, but also the results and what they were doing on offense. So we'll have to see. And clearly he was fired in Chicago. Now he might've been the scapegoat. I don't know, but, but he didn't last there. So there is question marks there, but we're going to go in with an open mind, but I'm just really curious like you are on what he's going to do. He's got some, some obviously some street cred. I don't think Antonio Pierce would have hired him if the reports on him were terrible. So we'll see. But then again, Antonio Pierce, even though he's got relationships, he's got Marvin Lewis in the building, all, Tom Coughlin, all that stuff that we've heard about. He's still a first time head coach, too. So you 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 make hires. Maybe they work out. Maybe they don't work out. But to me, it's going to be one of the biggest keys of the season is how does Luke Getze do and how is he able to take what he has? Because he does have those weapons on offense, but he also has a quarterback situation that's good, but unknown at this time. Who's going to win out? We'll have to see. Uh, but Raider Lake, Raider Loke, excuse me, as always, thanks for calling in, man. We appreciate you. You've been so loyal to us. And um, anytime you call, we can appreciate that. And sorry for your 90 minute commute. That's a long commute. But like you said, SoCal, baby, it happens all over the place. But anyway, thank you to everybody for calling in. And by the way, if you want to call in for Tuesday's or excuse me, Thursday's show, I get my days right. Make sure you call 702-900-7869 is the number you can get on. Name, where you're calling from, and then your question or comment. If you want to text us instead, instead do that, 702-900-7869. Just leave the message texted with your name and where you're, where you're texting from as well, just so we can give you a shout out. We don't, we've had some great calls on here and people don't leave their names. Luckily, they get back to us and say, hey, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get with you. Uh, but, but make sure you do that as soon as you can. But we'd love to have you part of the show. So don't, don't be shy. You can text if you, if you don't want to be, if you want your voice heard, totally fine. Just text us and we'll be able to do that as well and get you on the show. I want to thank again, Matthew Collar from Purple Insider for being our guest today and talking about Alexander Madison. What do you guys think about Madison and what he's going to be able to bring to the Raiders? Leave comments below uh, either wherever you're listening to us. If you're listening to us on Spotify, get lots of comments and questions on Spotify. Also on YouTube, clearly. If you're there, subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio and also on YouTube, hit subscribe and the notifications bell. We appreciate that very much. Would love to hear from you guys as always. And sometimes I disagree and we 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 go at it sometimes in those in those little comments, especially if you know you're you're being a snapperhead. If you're being a snapperhead, I'm gonna be a snapperhead back at you just for fun. I don't take it personal, but we'll we'll get into it anyway. But anyway, appreciate it. Uh, love our listeners and our viewers, and uh, appreciate you guys being with us as always. Now we will be back on Thursday with a new show. Again, Mo is off this week. He'll be back on Tuesday, so you'll have me again along with another guest on Thursday. We'll see who that is. Maybe it's a surprise. Stick tuned for that, and uh, we will talk to you on Thursday. Raider Nation, have a good early week, and we will talk to you again 
later this week. Enjoy yourselves. Be good to one another. And for my producer, Mike Robier, I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. Take care, everybody.